Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. We have a powerful lesson today, as we always do. I am Benita Gillespie, and I'll be bringing you this week's Sunday School lesson. I'd like to welcome you, as I always do. Thank you for taking the time out to join in with me in the studying of this week's Sunday School lesson. Um, it is called Call to Testify. We're going to look at John, the fourth chapter. We're looking at verses 25 through 42. And our lesson focus uh, for this week is, ask Jesus to reveal himself to your community through your witness. Hope you caught that. Ask Jesus to reveal himself to your community through your witness. Powerful, powerful lesson. But, but as always, I like to begin in prayer. So if you would bow with me wherever you are, that you would come in agreement with me, knowing where two or more are gathered together in his name, touching and agreeing upon anything according to his will, the Lord will be in the midst of it. So bow with me right now as we go to the throne of grace. Father God, we come humbly, submissively, and yet boldly to your throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Father, we thank you for this another day, this another opportunity to get it right. We ask, Father, that you have mercy upon each and every one of us and forgive us all of our sins. Father, we ask that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray a special blessing upon those under the sound of my voice that you would first search every heart and then, Lord, that you would meet every need according to your will and according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit have its way even right now, that you anoint me for teaching, that the words of my mouth and the very meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our God, you are our strength, and you are our Redeemer. Let us get out of this lesson, whatever that it is that you have for each and every one of us. And, Father, we will be ever careful to give you the praise. We love you so much for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Call to testify. So in this week's lesson, I'm first going to give you a little history of the background about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Um, so the Samaritans can be traced back to Israel's northern 10 tribes. Remember, there were 12 tribes of Israel, but the Samaritans can be traced back to 10 of those tribes who flagrantly disobeyed God. So out of 12 of them, 10 disobeyed God. So eventually the Assyrians captured and exiled, you know, most of the people from those 10 tribes back in 722 B.C. And you can find that in 2 Kings, the 17th chapter. But the remaining two southern tribes, which were Benjamin and Judah, hated and rejected the remaining northern brothers because the Assyrians moved Gentile people into the north, and those Gentiles intermarried with the remaining Israelites. So that hatred lasted well until Jesus came um, down on earth. But you know Jesus, thank you, Lord, he still cared for the Samaritans, even though everyone else hated them. And that's, that's how Jesus is. It doesn't matter who hates you or what group of people you may be or category you fit in, Jesus is going to love you anyway. He's going to love you anyway. So Jesus cared for the Samaritans. And by showing compassion to this Samaritan woman, Jesus drew a part of this hatred group back to the Father. And you know what? After one meeting with Jesus, the Samaritan woman became one of God's precious vessels to pour out 
his love and truth to the Samaritans after one meeting. And that's a message for you and I. When we encounter Jesus Christ for our own self, you shouldn't be the same. You should not be the same before that encounter. So it took one meeting with Jesus for this woman. But through her testimony, many became believers in Christ. That's why our testimony is so important. It's so important in our walk with Christ. Because your testimony, my testimony, can bring many to Christ who were unbelievers before. And then Jesus revealed his identity. You know, in the course of this conversation that Jesus was having with this uh, Samaritan woman, he eventually revealed his true identity. He convinced her that he was the Christ, the anticipated Messiah. Because you remember the former uh, prophets of old, they prophesied that the Lord was going to send a Messiah. So a, a lot of people believed that. They were looking for this Savior who would save them from their sins and would save the world. So he convinced her he was Christ. He was that Messiah. I am the one that you all have been waiting on. And he then told her personal details about her life. He spoke to the empty places within her heart, and he promised to fill them with himself. Isn't that awesome? And you know, you think about your life, and I think about my life, and I know for me as a born-again believer, Jesus did the same to me. He, he, he spoke to those empty places within my heart that I needed him to fill, and that's what he did to her. And then, because of that, she placed her faith in his words. She believed his words. And you know, if you go back to John 1 and 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So she placed her faith in his words, which is him. She returned back to her village or her community or her city and told the men about Christ. God used her testimony and many people came out to the well to meet Jesus. That is powerful. All of us have a testimony. Never hold back your testimony because you never know who God has placed around you that needs to hear that testimony. Not only do they need to hear it, they need to see it and they need to believe it. So they too can put their trust in God. And then do God's will. You know, after the Samaritan woman left Jesus at the well and she returned back to the city, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, they were trying to get him, they encouraged him to eat food that they had brought. But Jesus replied, he said, listen, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And that's in John 4 and 32. And they were kind of puzzled. They was like, okay, did somebody go get you some food? Or how's that so? We were out looking for food for you. They asked, where did he get this food? And then Jesus went on to explain that doing God's will was his nourishment. And if you think back that when Jesus fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights and Satan came to him and Jesus was weak, he was hungry. And the first thing, and Satan knew that. And the first thing Satan came to him and said, uh, if you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus told him then, that as it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so Jesus was telling them then, listen, I have food that you don't even know of. And my food and my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me. 
That's a message for you and I. And then work in God's fields. Jesus gave his disciples a picture of harvest fields ready for reaping. And in this picture, Jesus was referring to the Samaritans who were an unlikely delegation to receive Jesus' message. They were unlikely to receive it. Even people in the world who have not confessed and believed upon Christ, and you think that your testimony won't even reach them. See, the Samaritans wasn't even a likely delegation to receive the message. But Jesus was telling them. He said he demonstrated to his disciples that through that conversation, he had with that woman that people were ready to listen. They were ready because she went back to the city and told the men. And guess what? They were ready. I want to hear what this man has to say. So God placed a vacuum in the heart of every person that only he can feel. And sometimes you may go through life and you feel like you have it all. You may have the kind of job you want. You may make the kind of money you want to make. You may live in the kind of house you want to live in. You may even have a significant other who you pray to God about. But yet it can still be something missing in your heart. There can still be a void. And that is Jesus Christ and only he can feel it. Only he can feel it. So these people, they want to hear about the Lord. And don't you know all God needs is a faithful worker to proclaim the truth. That's all he needs. And by one woman sharing her testimony, you know what it did? It enlightened an entire city. One person, one person can change a community just from their testimony alone. One faithful Christian sharing the gospel can make a huge difference in many lives. And that's the backdrop of our lesson, what we're going to jump right into, scripture. And our first set of scripture is titled, The Samaritan Woman's Testimony. And we're going to look at John 25 John 4, verses 25 through 30, and I will be reading the NIV version. And it said, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will exp explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. And what this particular pa passage of scripture is saying, that when Jesus encountered the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus immediately entered into a conversation with her by first asking for a cup of water. He's at the well, and he initiated that conversation. Remind you of, the scripture that says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone let me in, I'll come in and sup with them and them with me. And we're talking about the door of your heart. So Jesus struck up the conversation by first he was knocking, asking her for a cup of water. And it was Jesus's way of getting her to think about the promised Messiah. You're already believing in it. You already believe he's coming. So Jesus, that was his way to get her to think about that. And then for her to think about him quenching 
people's spiritual thirst as well as revealing himself to be the Christ. See, as Christian believers, once you confess and believe upon Christ, your spirit should automatically start hungering and thirsting after righteousness. It ought to. You ought to want to draw closer to the Lord. And so Jesus was telling her, listen, I can quench your thirst because I'll give you living water. Lord have mercy. It was then that Jesus' disciples approached them and were shocked. You know, they were shocked that Jesus was even conversing with a Samaritan woman, though they did not express their amazement. But you know, Jesus knows all and sees all. He knows the intent of the heart. He knows the motive behind what you do, why you do it, what you say, and why you say it. So Jesus already knew what they were thinking, but they dare not ask. And then the woman, she rushed into the city to tell the residents and everybody else that someone conveyed her past to her and wondered out loud whether he could be the Messiah. So the Samaritans, they immediately raced out of that city to come see this man, to come meet Jesus. That woman didn't keep quiet and go back to her town and act like nothing happened. She went back to sure what she just encountered. And that made a difference. Our second uh, set of scripture, the disciples' opportunities for evangelism. We just talked about her testimony. Now it's going to be an opportunity for the, the disciples to evangelize. And the NIV reads, verses 31 through 38, says, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? Still four months unto harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. And what Jesus is saying, and he's saying that with the Samaritan woman, his disciples had collected food, which they brought to him. So he's telling them, however, he told them that he was sustained by food about which they didn't know of. And, and we know that Jesus was saying that his food came from doing the will of his father. So after Jesus hearing them ask each other whether someone had already provided him with food and Jesus told them that his food was doing his heavenly father's will and completing the work God had sent him to do. And we know that the completion was done on the cross. That completed it. And then to make plain what he meant, the Lord compared bringing people into his father's kingdom by describing such evangelism with harvesting crops instead indicating that harvest was ripe for reaping. He had to, you know, Jesus used parables. And they were earthly stories with heavenly meaning. But in order for the, his disciples to understand and even for us to understand, he had to use heavenly um, Store, I mean, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. So they understood crop. They understood growing and harvesting and reaping it. But indeed, they needed to open their eyes to the harvest of people and not just crop, which had been sown by others. There were prophets 
and before them and, and who did the labor. You think about it all, who were proclaiming Christ, who was teaching the word of God. So there were the others before them who had sown. But here they come and they could reap the crop of men and women for eternal life. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do. And truly God will, re will reward both the sower and the reaper. And they will rejoice together at the benefits of their hard labor. See, and you think about a history of our ancestors and forefathers. And some of the benefits that we're benefiting from were done not because we did it, it's because those that came before us sacrificed and did the hard work. Did, I mean, even the right to vote, even the right to be treated equal. You know, even though in God's eye, we all should be equal. But we've gone through this world where equality wasn't for everybody. But you had people who sacrificed their lives before you even came on the scene to fight for that right. They did the work and we're benefiting from what they did. And that's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. Listen here, I need you to focus on the harvest of people. That's what I need you. The work has been done. Now you are reaping from the benefit. It's wide open for evangelism. I spoke to this woman at the well before you even came and let her know who I was and why I was here. She went back and told the village and she came back. Now here's an opportunity for you to evangelize that whole city and change that whole city to believe in me. And that's all Jesus was saying in this part. There are people who fought for what we have a right to do right now and we're be reaping the benefits. And then our last set of scripture, the fruit of the Samaritan woman's testimony. John 4, verses 39 through 42, the NIV reads, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard of for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. That is awesome. They say in, in this particular passage of scripture, her testimony had a marvelous effect on the Samaritans who heard what she declared about Jesus. For many of them came to believe in him from her testimony. But moreover, they urged Jesus to remain with them. And he did stay with them for two more days. And you know what? even more Samaritans became believers. And their trust in Jesus was de deepened because they listened to Jesus' teaching for themselves. You know, her testimony played a huge part. But even just hearing the word of God and knowing for yourself, having your own personal relationship with Christ will deepen your trust in him. So they believed her, but the, they wanted Jesus to say, because how can you hear the word and not want to hunger and thirst after of it? Not want to hear more. When you open the word of God and read, you ought to want to keep reading and keep learning all you can about him because it draws you closer to him. And so even with her testimony, they wanted Jesus to say, to stay with them. And he did for two more days. But the more he talked and the more he spoke, even more came to believe. And they finally could say, you know what? We believed you, your testimony, but because we heard it for ourselves, we heard his teaching, we heard the word from him for ourselves, it made us believe even more. And that's what it's all about. So indeed, they proclaimed Jesus to be the Savior of the world. And in closing, the incident at the well in Samaria 
was significantly instructive, not only for Jesus' disciples, but for us as well today. Jesus first demonstrated to whom he wanted to reveal his identity. And then he explained why we should spread the gospel through an easily identifiable illustration about farming. Remember the parables? Earthly stories, heavenly meanings. The two pillars of Jesus' earthly ministry are show and tell. His life, we're talking about Jesus Christ, is a model of how we should live our lives. And then his teachings are a roadmap as to what we should, as to what we should do with our lives. His life was the model. His words is the roadmap. So when Jesus encountered the Samaritan woman at the well, he asked her for some water. And then he offered her true living water. In response, she inquired, what is that living water? And he told her that he is that water. Moreover, he declared that he is the Messiah. And you know, Jesus' disciples were dumbfounded that their master was conversing with a Samaritan woman. But Jesus told them that the crop is ripe for harvest. His message to them, as it is to us, is that there are many people who need him and we are to share him with them. In this world today, there's still too many unsaved believers. And we all have a testimony. And that's our job, to share our testimony with others so that they can come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I hope this message was a blessing to you about harvesting and your testimony and how important it is to change a community, to ch change a city, to change a state, and therefore change a nation. I pray that you take this word and that you share your testimony with all those you can and help lead all those you can to Christ. Because in the end, only what you do for Christ is going to last. God bless you. You have a blessed week.